amazing things through him in Japan. And you're going to hear this a lot. You should come to Japan. And so would you give him a round of applause as we welcome him? Good morning, you guys. All right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and be able to share the things that God is doing through us in Japan. And uh, let me start by uh, sharing with you just who we are. I uh, introduce my family to you. Uh, this is my family and my lovely wife, Jenny. She's in the back somewhere. Uh, we have three kids, Sarah, Jacob, and Abigail. Sarah is 16. Uh, we also call her Chuhi uh, by her Korean name. And uh, Jacob is Hangje. He's 14. And Abigail Chian, she is nine years old. But before I continue, let me just pray for us. God, we thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the work that you're doing in Japan. Thank you uh, for loving us, Lord God. And in your love, Lord God, that we were able to love those around us and that we're able to, that you sent us to Japan to love those in Japan. So as we uh, share about the things that you're doing there, may you be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are missionaries in Fukuoka, Japan. Uh, We've been there for 14 years now, and a lot of people don't know where Fukuoka is, so that it's right there where the arrow was pointing. A lot of people think of missions in terms of Tokyo or Osaka, or just thinking about Japan in general, right? Or Kobe or Kyoto, but they don't really think about Fukuoka. But actually, Fukuoka has an international airport, and we are, uh, it's closer to flight to uh, Seoul than it is to Tokyo from Fukuoka. And so, uh, come and visit if you get a chance. We arrived in Japan November of 2010. Uh, as you see in the picture, that is our Juhi. She is just under three years old, and Sungjin, he is six months old. You will not see Abigail, our, our Chien, because she was made in Japan. <laughs> when we think about Japan, you know, a lot of people ask, why Japan? You know, when we think about missions, you think about like third world countries, think about Africa, uh, like Vietnam, or you know, like uh, very like jungle areas, right? But you know, Japan's known for their high technology. They're known for great food, sushi, ramen, uh, udon, you know, things like that. Um, our part of Fukuoka, or Fukuoka is known for their tonkotsu ramen, the pork broth ramen. So if you like ramen, come to Japan. And so as God was leading us to just pray through uh, where he's sending us to uh, missions, he was just continued to lead us in different ways and confirming ways of um, sending us to Japan. <clears throat> and one of the things that he taught us as we were praying through that is that there are so few Christians in Japan, so few believers in Jesus, only 0.4%. You'll, if you do research, you might hear like 1% or 2%, but that includes like anyone and everyone related to Christ in name in, like, in any way. Like, so Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Catholics, we'll put it all into the 1% to 2%, but 0.4% are the, like, the Bible-believing Christians who go to church. And even of that, uh, apparently we heard only half of that, half of them actually go to church regularly. So it's very, very challenging, very, very small population of those who are saved. Uh, I believe there, well, I'm assuming that there might be even more Christians in like this part of Houston there are in all of Japan. Isn't that crazy? That's so crazy, right? So I'm going to share with you just a couple of things that uh, is uh, causing that, okay? The barriers of Christianity. Why is it that so many people don't understand or don't want to believe or can't believe the gospel? Well, one is that they see um, Christianity as a Western religion. And so, like, there's three alphabets in the Bible. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in, Jap in Japan. And so they have the hiragana, the kanji characters, which is the Chinese characters. And then they have katakana. And katakana is used for foreign borrowed words. And so when they open the Bible, you know, you read a lot of names and things that are like Greek names and Hebrew names. And so there's lots of foreign words in there, right? And so when they open the Bible, they just see lots of katakana. They think, oh, wow, this is like a foreign Bible or foreign book. Must be a foreign religion per se. But then also when they see lots of missionaries, a lot of missionaries, people who are Christian, come from the West. And so they think, oh, again, Christianity must be a Western religion. And so what that means to them is, if I become a Christian, am I no longer Japanese? Do I have to give up being Japanese? And so for them, that's, that's a huge like, worldview thing that they have to work through. And that, that's just one thing, right? And so another thing is um, the word sin. For Even for us, as we talk about sin, it's, it's kind of a difficult um, 
Uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult for understand, even in English, right? But in Japanese, there's not a direct like translation for sin, and so the word is "simi," which means like crime. And so when we talk about like, for we are all sinners, they'll say, "I'm not a criminal. I didn't break any crime." And so we actually have to like break it down and explain to them in, in the simplest terms of what sin is. And so those are just a couple of reasons why they're barriers. And as we found out more and more of these things that are keeping the Japanese people from the Lord, you know, the verses like this you know, spoke to us and continue to motivate and continue to compel us to go to Japan. It's Paul writing to the Romans, and he says, It's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. So our prayer is that the Japanese people would see and hear and understand the good news of Jesus Christ, that they can be saved. So I want to share with you, um, you know, God's been doing a lot of different things in, our, in the past 14 years, uh, but I just want to share with you the things that he's been doing in the past three years. So he led us to start something called uh, Ito Christ Center, and in that process, he led us to buy this pur- uh, purchase this property. And so this is the White House in the back that you see, and the plot of land, and the, uh, the brown house on the side is our neighbor's. And so he led us to buy this, and on that plot of land, he led us to build this property. So this uh, new building in the front is called, we call it Megumi House. Megumi means grace. And the house in the back is called Joy House. And so if any of you come to visit, um, we actually use Joy House as our guest house. And so feel free to come to Japan. One of the interesting things about this place is that this Ito Christ Center is right next to a shrine. And so it's a, it's a beautiful shrine, you know, um, a lot of people who come from the West, they wake up super early because of the jet lag and whatnot, and they'll go up this shrine, and uh, on top of the mountain, you can see the, the main part of Fukuoka, the city, and it's beautiful. So you can see the sunrise, and see the city, and you can pray over the city. Uh, some of our friends in Japan, they joke and say, if they make a wrong turn wanting to go into the shrine, they might actually come into our church. So we look forward to that. So some of the ministries we do at Ito Christ Center, uh, we have uh, Ito Christian School, which is, uh, we call it a free school. And what that means is it's a school for students who can't go to normal school. Either they were bullied, maybe they um, just don't fit into that Japanese school system for whatever reason. But uh, for the most part, no one really knows why. But these students just can't go to school. And so they just stay home um, and they become more and more recluse. They become uh, more and more depressed. And so as they live this lifestyle longer and longer, you know, um, you know, they might turn into this something called a hikikomori. And hikikomori are people who have become recluse. Um, and you know, they, it's difficult for them to even meet people and talk with people. Um, and so a lot of them, in depression, they commit suicide. And it's very, very challenging. So we really want to reach out to these students as well. And so one of the things that we do is the school. We also, um, so, you know, Japan is, is one of those countries where a lot of people don't think about missions because they don't need, like, medical care. They don't need um, uh, uh, wells, like, for drinking water or things like that. But one of the things that they need is actually English. They're very, very... Um, uh, uh, they learn English at school, but they learn, they learn academically. But in terms of speaking, in terms of listening, you know, you'll, uh, most people, if you write down like sentences, their grammar is like way better than all of yours, probably. But you speak to them, and they're like, you know, they'll turn their head. Hmm? You know, they they won't know what you're saying. Um, and so, one of the things that we do is we teach English and help them English, not academically, but speaking and listening. And so we have about 50 students or so coming uh, currently, and at the peak, we had about 70 students come weekly. Uh, that person in the back, uh, the Caucasian guy with the mustache, uh, he's, his name is Dustin. His wife, Faith, is our teammates, and they're right now in Japan, and they're holding down the fort while we're here in the States. So for you guys, if you speak English, come to Japan. All right. So through making those relationships through the English classes and just living life in Japan, uh, we want to we invite them to more gospel-focused events. And so VBS, you know, most of you are very familiar probably with VBS. And so that's something very new and something very different for Japan. So we have that. We call it EBSS. So we add the English, right? So it's called English Bible Summer School. 
play games, uh, hear the gospel message every day. Um, uh, one really cool thing that we have them do is memorize scripture. For every scripture they memorize, they get uh, a ticket. And with the ticket, on the very last day, they have a marketplace and they buy stuff, right? And so uh, this is, uh, I think, our like sixth year or so having uh, this VBS. And so some of the students are already memorizing or they're reciting the verses that they remember from last year so that they get prepared to get these tickets, right? The power of tickets, all right? Um, so if you love VBS, come to Japan. Uh, let's see. And so about in 2018, I believe, um, we had 34 students raise their hand making professions of faith. Totally awesome, right? And you have to take it with a grain of salt because they're like young kids, right? But still, we wanted to do something with them uh, to not just make VBS just once a year. And so we did this Kids English Bible School. And so this is a kind of monthly mini VBS that they come to uh, hear the message, uh, you know, the Word of God, you know, once a month, memorize scripture again, play games, uh, pray, sing praise songs. So, so uh, you know, pray for these kids too who are, who are coming uh, uh, monthly. I didn't mention this in the first service, but if they come to this event, uh, so in our English classes, we give uh, stickers. And if they get like a certain amount of stickers, they get prizes. And so if they come to this, they get like two stickers, right? And so they are really motivated to come to this kind of event too. So, you know, power of stickers too. Um, so even in our VBSs, we have, summer, uh, we have teams that come that can't come during summertime. And so because of teams that come like during the winter and spring, we actually started VBSs during those seasons as well. So now we have English Bible Winter School, English Bible Spring School also. So we're really excited about doing those things too. We also reach out to... Um, oh, this is the Kids English Bible School picture. All right. So... We, oops. we also reached out to like the young kids. So um, a lot of the, in that area, there's Kyushu University, which is uh, one of the top universities in Japan. And there's uh, quite a large international students. There's, I think, 2,300 international students. But then also the professors there and their families, they are wanting to... Um, uh, provide their children uh, with more, the, the, you know, they want them to be exposed to English. So their moms will bring uh, their kids and to kind of hear English while they're young, but then also the moms want to practice English too. So Jenny reaches out to them once a month. We have these uh, classes for these kids and their moms. We have other special events like, you know, um, this is our Easter egg hunt that we did at the shrine. And we, you know, uh, try to do whatever we can, Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas to share the gospel with these these young people and and their families as well. Uh, we try to teach guitar. Uh, we have uh, something called Ito Share, uh, which is you know things that people don't need anymore that's still usable. They'll bring, and then people who need them, they'll come and, and take them. And one of the things that's uh, really uh, challenging for these international students who come are these things called Lanuseru. These uh, lenders that are the uh, the Japanese backpacks, right? And they're super expensive. And you know, once you buy them, you take use them from like first grade all the way to sixth grade. But when the international students come for just a couple of years, they don't want to spend like two, three, eight hundred dollars for these backpacks. And so this is a wonderful event to really bless those um, those who who come. All right. One of the huge, um, you know, COVID was hard for a lot of us, right? Um, but uh, one of the blessings that came out for us is when COVID started, we started a family worship service at home. And then when uh, God led us to start Ito Christ Center, we uh, trans transitioned that family worship service to Ito Christ Center and became Ito Christ Fellowship. So it became like an organic church plant. So right now we get anywhere from like 15 to 30 people coming on a weekly basis. Um, we get international students, but then we also get our Japanese friends neighborhood, from the neighborhood who want to learn English as well. And so, you know, uh, we have friends from Chuhi's friends, Sungji's friends who come, and even Chien's friends who come and hang out with us on those days, and they're able to uh, hear the God's word. They don't understand all of it, um, but uh, you know, they're at, at least they're able to experience God's love just being in that environment. One of the things that we do uh, in that place, in, in, in the name as well, is fellowship. And food is so important in fellowship. So we eat very well, thanks to my wife and many others. This is our, uh, one of our Thanksgiving, um, oh, it's lagging, sorry. 
Okay, this is our, oh, I'll let you control it. Uh, so the next one is our Thanksgiving um, meal that we had. We had like so many people come. We had so many people that we want to invite that we actually had to hold two Thanksgiving celebrations uh, this year. And, you know, it's not just eating together, but we, we share a message. We share the message of thanking God and all things that we have. It, it comes from God, right? And so it's the time for them to hear the gospel, um, but then also share it in fellowship and share God's love together. All right. One of the blessings that we had this past year, this Easter, was we had baptism. So our Juhi and one of her friends, Hikari Chang, uh, she was bapt- uh, they were baptized on that day. And again, the picture on the, uh, the top right is food. We, we had fellowship that day together as well. And so it's not just the fellowship of food, right? But it's, it's that uh, we can break... One, our hope is that we can break bread together um, and just have uh, spiritual communion with our brothers and sisters in Japan. Uh, these are some ways that you can connect with us. We have a, a Facebook, we have a website, uh, we have Instagram, so you guys can check it out. And the next slide is our QR code. Uh, it just has a brief summary of us, uh, also a giving portion, and then also you can sign up for our newsletter. We used to sign up, uh, we used to send out newsletters monthly, then bi monthly. Now it became quarterly. Uh, so if you'd like to hear more about the things that God is doing through us, please sign up for our newsletter. We have the QR code outside too. And so you guys can go ahead and share that too. Or click on that. I just want to finish off with a, uh, some prayer requests. Um, you know, pray for the students and the families that we're ministering to. Uh, pray for the, all the outreaches that we do there. That, you know, all things that we do, we really want to just glorify God. Um, Pray for our, our teammates, Dustin and Faith, uh, as they're holding on the fort for us. Uh, pray for our family as we're in transition here in the States, uh, especially for our oldest, because she wants to stay in, in America and finish off high school in America. And so that's uh, lots of decisions to be made. Um, and lastly, you know, pray, consider if God is calling you to partner with us in some way and visit us in Japan. I think that's some stuff. Oh, wait, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray for you. Um, we're going to spend some time praying for Peter and his family. Where's Jenny? Just hand. Oh, she's in the back. You, you can come up and join us. And then um, where's Sarah? You don't have to join us. You can just raise your hand. There she is in the back. And then Jacob, where are you at? Oh, he's over here in the front. And then Abigail is at Children's, right? Yes. So uh, she's not here. We won't, just kidding. We're praying, we're praying for her too. Uh, <laughs> can you just uh, turn in some direction? Not Don't make it awkward, but just turn in some direction to one of their family members. And then uh, you can kind of also very discreetly kind of you know, point your palms, uh, just kind of laying up hands. We're going to pray for them. If you could put the prayer request on, on, on the back. Not that people are going to have their eyes open, but you can put it up there. Um, I just pray for them really quickly. Um, do indeed pray for all the work that they're doing in Japan. To be in a country where it's only 0.4% Christian, that's rough. Uh, the other place that we go to, Thailand, is like 1.2%. It's rough. And so uh, please do pray for them and all that they have going on. And also, uh, they've been in California for a little bit. And again, uh, there's a lot of decisions to be made. Sarah's a junior in high school, and so there's a lot of di- different decisions. Please pray for that. And of course, the teamwork thing is huge. And so please pray for Dustin and his family and that they're able to represent gospel, uh, the, the church, uh, together. So. Can we take some time to pray for them? And then I'll close this, and then we'll jump into the sermon. So let's pray together. Pray with me as we pray for the O family. Lord God, we give you so much thanks for you have placed a very special call upon this family to go into the nation of Japan, particularly Fukuoka, to do a work that is so very difficult to do. 
the gospel does not take root there very easily, and yet you've called them. And because you've called them, we pray that you'd be faithful to them. You've been faithful over these last 14 years, and we pray for many, many more years, however long you call them, to be faithful to them. Be with them, give them wisdom for the many different things that they must decide and do uh, here in the near future and on beyond. Pray for their team in uh, Fukuoka that they would really embody and show and therefore be a testament of your Christ church, Lord, that we are the body that get together and we love one another. Bless all the different things that they're doing. Bless their hands. But most importantly, would you bless their call, that they would be blessed to be called by you and therefore sent by you. And through them, that indeed your kingdom will be built maybe in little ways, maybe in fruit that they will not see in their lifetime, but indeed fruit that you will indeed produce as the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And so we pray for these workers whom you've sent. And would you pray for us? We pray that we would partner with them, pray for them, send people, send support, so that indeed they would be strengthened and encouraged by us here at RK in Houston so that they can continue to do the work that they've been called to do. We give you thanks and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You probably thought there's not going to be a sermon today. There is. And so, uh, <laughs> like, no. um, I promise. We'll, we'll try to keep it short. Actually, I don't do anything short, so uh, I can't promise you that. But anyways, let's just jump right in. Because Peter and Jenny and their family are here, we're going to take a quick break from the Abram series, jump back right, in, right into it next week, okay? And then today we're going to talk about missions. Now, here's a very interesting thing about missions, Okay. We as a church, if you read through all of our stuff, and if you're a member here, you know we're all about missions. It's at the heart of who we are. The people who go into membership class, they'll tell you we're all about mission, right? So we love mission. It's why we preach about it all the time when we're not preaching other series. Another thing about missions, if you read through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, it's very abundantly clear that missions is everywhere. We are supposed to be missional. God's people are supposed to be missional. If you're just wondering, here's a sampling of scripture that talks about mission. And this is not all of it. This is just a small little sampling. So missions is huge. But here's the thing that's most interesting about missions, in my opinion. Even though we are a church who at the core is all about mission, and even though the scriptures make abundantly clear that we all should be very missional, right? The reality is, We in our lives, the way that we live day in and day out, or year in and year out, if you will, we're just not all that missional, if we're just being honest. If you don't know, I've long said that I think the standard for us as Christians here in the West, here in Houston, here at our church, is that we, depending, no matter what life stage, we should go on missions at least once every three years. I, because I'm crazy, I think it should be every year, but again, if we're just talking about life, once every three years ought to be the standard, and so if you use this as a standard, I think we can say that we're just not all that missional, because you probably haven't gone once every three years. Now, to be clear, this is not an issue that only we suffer with here at RK. It's not just our church problem. It is a problem throughout many churches all across the nation and the world, but if you're like, oh my goodness, Pastor Pete's going to do this thing again where he's going to tell us to go on missions, yada, 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 and he's going to guilt trip us, I'm not here to do that. Because if you are feeling like, although I understand mission, and we should be missional, and I'm not missional, here's the thing. I simply, I get it. I understand. I know for a fact that there are many people here in the room who want to be missional, who want to go on missions, who've said to me, I want to go and I want to do these things, so on and so forth. Many of your hearts burn with a passion to go to missions. I know that for a fact, but be as it may, though your hearts may burn and though you wish to go, it's still seemingly the answer that always ends up winning or the answer that always ends up coming up always is, well, maybe next time. And I know why that's the case. Because there are many obstacles that prevent us from going on missions. For some of the students, i got to take summer school this summer because i got to get ready for college, so on and so forth. I get it i got to study for LSATs, MCAT, whatever, whatever, right? Major exams that I could do. I get it. Families, I've got young children. How do you do and go missions with young children? How do I leave them home? Whatever. I get it. Young professionals, I don't have enough PTO. I have to do a lot of traveling, this event here, family, this, all these things. I don't have PTO left, so how am I supposed to go? I get it. There are many reasons as to why this doesn't happen, and I'm telling you, I do get it. So even though we may have the desires, because simply like the but hows and the what about this is, like we end up usually going, well, maybe next time. Sad to officially announce it here, but our Thailand trip for February, canceled. Not enough people to go. I get it. 
So missions in the reality of the world that we live in is kind of like this. Missions is where our heart or our desire, it meets reality. And unfortunately, most of the time, reality wins. Maybe next time. To put it funny to me the way that I understand it, reality is to our mission's wishes that which Thanos is to the Avengers. It just dies. It just happens. Nobody laughed. It was supposed to be a joke. Too serious. Now, please don't hear me wrong. I'm not advocating for some irresponsible, ir- irrational, like whatever YOLO mentality mission or whatever the young people are saying today is you probably aren't saying YOLO anymore, but just get over it, right? I'm not just saying just go, whatever. No, I'm not saying that. Not at all. The hows and the what about this is are important and must be addressed properly, okay? So don't go home telling your parents that Pastor Pete told you to just go. That's not what I'm telling you. But here's what I am wondering, and therefore what I am telling you this morning. I wonder, with all of our obstacles and the hows and the what about this is, are we faithfully addressing the hows and the what about this is? As in, are we addressing them with a full of faith mindset, faithfully? Or are we addressing them with a fear and doubt mindset at the forefront of minds? Fearfully or doubtfully, if you will. Because to me, there's a major difference between the two, and for me, it is the critical difference. Our scripture, right, today makes clear, and I hope this is good news to you, that the doubts and the fears and the obstacles, all of that are real, and they are not the problem. Hear me again. The doubts, the obstacles, and issues are not the problem with why we are not as missional as we would like to be. They must be dealt with. But the problem is this. The problem is how these are faithfully addressed. Or better, with whom are we addressing these doubts, issues, and obstacles? Because make sure, Moses, as amazing as a person as he was, he was, in my opinion, one of the, if not the most doubtful and fearful missionaries God has ever called and sent with the exception of Isaiah and Jonah, who wished to die at some point during their ministries, Moses takes the cake. He might be the worst. So the doubts are real. They must be addressed. And the question that I think we should ask ourselves today is this. Am I willing to faithfully address my obstacles with God just as Moses does? Because I think that's the answer, or that's the question that we're not asking and therefore not addressing. Because if we are, let me put this bold statement, if we are willing to faithfully address our obstacles and our doubts and our fears with God, as we'll see in our text today, I believe that God addresses most, if not all, of the issues that we may or may not have. All. You heard me right. So today we're going to jump through some questions that I think the text asked and then deal with them and see at the end. Am I willing to address them faithfully? And then if I do, what is God going to do in me? Question number one then. What if I simply don't want to go? What if I don't have the desire to go? Well, this is you, good news and bad news. Good news first, you're not alone because Moses felt exactly the same way he did not want to go. There are some in the Bible that go, here I am, Lord, send me. Disciples immediately went, but Moses was simply not one of these folks. He's full of questions, doubts, and fears. Read Exodus 3 and 4. He's full of questions, doubts, and fears, and he's not shy about letting them know. So you can let God know your doubts and fears as well. Good news, you're not alone. But bad news, though Moses tries his darndest not to go, he still goes. Why? Because God calls him and he sends him. Why? Because simply missions, I hope you know, is a God thing. Missions is God's idea. Not yours. Not anyone else's. It's his idea. And because it's his idea, he sends, a.k.a. he commands us to go. By the way, even if you have a desire to go, did you know that that desire is not your own? Like, you didn't start that? That's God working in you. So the call to go is a call for us who are saved to go. That is always clear. Question number two. Then what if I'm not ready? It's a common one. It takes on many forms. For the young people, it's like, I might be too young. Or, I've only been Christian for a little while, so I don't really know what I'm doing. Or, my walk with God isn't so hot right now, so maybe I should go when my walk is doing better. Or, surely there are other people better suited than me. Look at all the deacons. Look at all these certain people. They would do much better than me. Why me and not them kind of idea. Well, if this is you, again, 
Good news. You're not alone because Moses is in the exact same place. Look at what he says in chapter 4, verse 10. We didn't read this. Moses says to Yahweh, Please, Yahweh, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Slow of speech, slow of tongue, you know what that means? It means Moses has a speech impediment. That's a big deal. That's a problem. Why? Moses has to go and speak lots of things. Can you imagine if Moses went in front of Pharaoh and was like trying to be like, hey, this is who my God is, this is who he is, yada, 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 blah, 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 let my people go, and he's fumbling his words and saying them backwards. Pharaoh would be like, seriously? Can you, get out of, can you get him out of here, this fool? Like, that's a big deal, right? So Moses addresses that question. I may not be ready, so on and so forth, but look at what God says to him in verse 11 of chapter 4. Yahweh says to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing blind? Is it not I, Yahweh? He says, Moses, I'm the one who makes your mouth. And I'm the one who tells it what to do. And I have control over all these things. If I can do that, then what what might I do with your speech impediment? Have you thought about that? We've said this about Abram. And we'll say it again. Let me make this abundantly clear. None of us are called because we're qualified. It is the call that qualifies us. Peter and Jenny, I believe, are wonderful missionaries, but they'll tell you, to your face, they were not called because they were qualified. It is the call that qualifies them. In reality, to call a people to go to a uh, place like Japan uh, when they were called is not a good thing. You don't call young parents of a three-year-old and a six-month-old to go to Japan. That's, they're literally maybe the least qualified because their life is crazy, they got kids, all that sort of stuff. If you've had kids, you know what I mean. But if the God of the universe calls you, what else do you need? Now you might be like, Pastor P, that's way too simple. You're you're dumbing it down way too much. Is that kind of unfair? You're being kind of unreasonable. Well, am I? I know stories where like parents want their kids to be the best thing in the world, right? And so they like sign up for all these lessons and whatever, and they're like trying to encourage them, yada, 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 and nothing's working. And then I know stories where they might meet a certain special person, a coach. And this coach is like a specialty, like master of their field or whatever. And they just kind of happen to get linked up like this. And then all of a sudden, everything changes, doesn't it? Doubt and fear turns to confidence and pride. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Why? Because they met a person that they respect, that has authority, that they think they can trust and do all these things. And all of a sudden, everything is changed. Now, no disrespect to the people that we might meet. That brings us confidence in our lives. But I think it needs to be asked. Why are so many of us so quick to believe in the words and encouragement of others, masters at their craft? Yes, but yet not willing to trust and believe and be changed by the words and the encouragement of God. What if I'm not ready? Well, God says, truthfully, doesn't really matter. As long as I call you and you trust me, you got everything you need. Then number three, related, but a little deeper. What if I'm afraid? What if I don't trust myself? You probably guessed it. This is you. Join the club. Moses is the president of this club too. Verse 11 of chapter 3. Right after God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh, here's what Moses says. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I, God? Why me? I got, I got lots of problems. Why me? A little later even, after God assures him that I'm the one who makes mouths and does all these things, you know what he says? Please, Yahweh, send anybody but me, essentially. Send the message by whomever, just not me. Moses teaches us that our obstacles and our fears, they're real, 100% real, and we must address them. But here's what God says to Moses, and therefore to us. Verse 12 of chapter 3, he says, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that is I who have sent you, When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. I will be with you, and when you do what I tell you to do, because I'm going to do it, then you're going to worship. Or verse 12, or chapter uh, 4. Now then, go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. Did you notice the answer isn't, hey, Moses, don't worry about it. You got this. You can do it. Wrong answer. Parents, stop telling your kids that on, on big things. That's not the answer. I won't tell you if you want to go on missions or if you want to go, you're fearful. Don't worry about it. You got it. No, you don't. You don't got it. Missions is not something that you do on your own. It's not something you can do on your own. You do it because God is with you. 
And what God is saying is this. It's really important. Oh my goodness, I did it again. I always give it away. There's supposed to be a blank slide there. Anyways, what God is saying is this. The reason why, right, the lack of qualifications, readiness, and preparedness is not really big of a deal is because God's call is way more important than your qualifications. Again, missions is not your idea. It's not your thing. And you absolutely cannot do it on your own. You can only do it if God is with you, if he equips you so that your weaknesses become strengths. So of course you're going to doubt. Of course you're going to have questions. Of course you're going to fear. Good. It means you recognize the task that he's called you to, that you cannot do on your own. But God says, if I am with you and for you and will never leave you nor forsake you, then what is it that you cannot do? Or better, what is it that I cannot do through you? That's a critical question we have to ask. I gave it away, but imagine asking a group of 7th graders. Connor's in 6th grade. He's about to go to 7th grade football, so that's what made me think about it. But let's think about basketball for a second. Imagine that you invited a 7th grade basketball team from Katy Junior High and said, you know what, you got to go play the varsity high school basketball team from Katy Senior High. Any takers? No one would take it. There may be that one kid, there's always that one kid who thinks he can beat everybody and he's wrong, but there's always that one kid. Outside of that one kid, no one's going to take that game ever. Why? It's a massacre. And if there's anything on the line, even more so, no one's taking it. But what if you said, hey, you're going to go, seventh grade team, play the varsity team, but you get LeBron James on your team. All six foot eight, 255 pounds of four-time MVP, four-time NBA champion LeBron James. Who's not saying yes? I'm saying yes. But again, for some reason, this same attitude that we would transfer to LeBron James, the confidence that LeBron James gives to me and my fears, for some reason doesn't transfer to God. Why is that? Paul says in Romans 8.31, not on your screen, what then shall I say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? But the story gets even better there. You would think after that, most would be like, okay, fine, God, I'll go. No, he doesn't. After all this stuff, for some reason, Moses still has the gumption to ask, okay, God, but please, please don't send me. And so what does God do? Well, we're told, sorry for the small text, he gets angry. He should. He has every right to. After all that, still, Moses, utterly offensive to God. Can you imagine how offended LeBron James would be if you didn't think that he could beat a bunch of high school kids? He'd be so offended. And yet, Moses has the gall to be like, God, no, 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 please, even with all that, don't send me. So God gets angry, but he provides Aaron, who speaks more fluently, Aaron to do most of the talking. Church, let me just tell you, are you fearful? Are you doubtful about missions? Good. You're in the right place. Why? Because we ought to be, because we cannot do it on our own. But if God has called you, and he's with you, and you trust that, what else could you possibly need? Last question. Why should I go, most importantly? Or why missions over all these things? Why put in all the work, Pastor Pete, to figure out the logistics? To answer the hows and the thises and the thats? Why make all the sacrifices I'm going to need to make? And there are many that you're going to need, probably need to make to go. Maybe the most blunt way you could put it is like, why now should I go? Why not later, Pastor Pete? Why so often? Now, let me say this. This is particularly, but this is to everyone, but particularly to the adults in the room. Before we address this question, let me say this first, because I, I think it needs to be said. I firmly believe, with all of my heart, that if every single one of you put missions as your number one priority in life, then you would definitively, without any doubt in my mind, at least go once every three years. Period. Do you know why? Because y'all are so capable. I've seen some of y'all do crazy things. And if you can do all those things, then I have no doubt in my mind, if you put missions as the number one priority, if you put it at the top of the list, that you would go. You would make it happen, because you make so many different things happen. And that goes for all of you young people, too. If you put your heart, soul, mind, and most importantly, your prayers behind the priority to go on missions, you will all definitively go. Take it to the bank. I guarantee it. Now, let's address the question, shall we? Why should I go? The reasons why you should go is twofold. One, because of God's great heart and God's great name. 
First, God's great heart. We cannot miss this. I told you that mission is a God thing. It's a God idea. Well, you see in this text that we read today, God initiates all of this. Did you see that? But did you catch why God initiates all of this? Why it's on his heart? Why he calls Moses? Did you catch that? Verse 7, he says, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. God says, I've seen their affliction. I've heard their cries, and I'm aware of their suffering. So verse 8 then, I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians to bring them up from their land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing of milk and honey. Missions, church, let me make this clear, is not a duty. Missions doesn't exist because we need to do so to be something that we're not. No, missions is God's response to our suffering, our pain, and our hurt. Missions is God's plan to rescue and deliver those who need to be rescued and delivered. We've been saying this a lot lately. Remember I told you we'll get to some of this later? Why are we called in the first place, do you know? We're called because we're saved. It's the saved people of God who are the sent people of God. And why are we saved? Because we needed rescue from our own sin and suffering. So Pastor Pete, why should I go now and not later? Why should I make all the sacrifices? Why should I put in all the work? Because God's heart yearns and burns for the suffering. It's why Peter and Jenny are suffering. I'm going to put it right out there. They're suffering in a country in which 0.4% of their population is Christian. 99.6% of all Japanese people are not Christian. Think about that. They've been there 14 years. Categorically in the world, we would call them failures. Why go? Because that's what God did for us. Is it not? I hope you hear this loud and clear. The call for missions isn't because it makes us a good church, isn't duty, responsibility, isn't what good Christians do. Those things, if that's what the reason why you go, if that's why you feel like missions, only lead to burden, shame, guilt, and all the stuff that we don't want anything to do with missions. The call for missions, let me be clear, is because the world needs to know that the God of the universe sees their affliction, hears their cries, and knows their suffering. Do you believe that the God of the universe hears your cries, knows your pain? And wants to deliver you. And God's plan to rectify that is missions. Hmm. So we go because of his great heart. But then second we go because of his great name. Now there's two aspects of this. And the first one is this. The reason why we go because of God's great name is because, well, the name thing is very important. Okay, let's break this down. In verse 13, right after Moses asks, who am I? He follows then with a very critical question. And he goes, God, then who are you? He says, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I'll say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. But they might say to me, God, what is his name? What shall I say to them then? He's asking, who do I tell them has sent me? Who do I tell them is calling them out of Egypt, out of slavery? And here's God's answer in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he says, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now before we get to the meaning of the name I am, let me address this one thing that's very important. The reasons why the Israelites would dare ask, who's sending you, Moses? Like, Who are we supposed to respond to? Is because the name of the person that's wanting to rescue them is very important there. Name, as you know, signifies power back in those days. So whoever's trying to rescue the Israelites out of Egypt, well, their name better be bigger than Pharaoh's name. Pharaoh, in those days, is maybe the biggest name in the world. Not too many are more powerful than he. So they're asking, who's calling us out of Egypt? Someone greater than Pharaoh, Moses says, or God says. But more than that. I think what they're asking is, why should we trust this name and leave? Because the one thing that we kind of forget is this whole thing of rescuing the Egyptians, our Israelites out of Egypt is a massive thing. It's so complicated, right? Moses isn't just going to walk into Egypt and be like, hey, can you let my people go? And then Pharaoh's like, okay, cool. That's not happening. There's so many things to happen. 
You got to move a bunch of people in a time where there are no airplanes or anything like that. You just got to move a bunch of people. Pharaoh's got to let them go. If Pharaoh lets all the slaves go, his entire economy dies generally. Why? Because the whole thing is built off of the backs of slaves, Israelites then. So there's so much that needs to be done. And so they're like, why should we even trust you? Who are you coming on behalf of? And Moses says, the I am. Well, God says, I am sending them. It's a power thing. Now, knowing then that the I am means power, here's really why we go based on God's name. Okay? When God says that I am who I am, here it is, what he's saying is really, really, really powerful. Three things that I want to highlight today, okay? And I want you to think about this and what it means to you as we finish. We'll get, oh, we got to go. First, when God says, I am, what God is saying is this. The I am is someone that has no beginning and therefore has no end. And therefore, he's simply saying, I always am. What he's saying about himself is this. Never can anyone in the world, in the history of the world, ever say about me, I was. Nor can they ever say about me, I will be. Why? Because I always am. This is a crazy statement, because what he's saying is there's no one ever in the history of the world, no one never before or ever to be, that'll ever be like me. Because no one, and I mean absolutely no one, can claim I always am. I have no beginning, I have no end. Can't nobody ever say that I was, and can't nobody ever say that I will be, because simply, I always am. And do you know how we know that this is what God is saying? Because he burns in the bush, the fiery bush. Crazy little side note here, really quickly. I find it fascinating that this entire narrative is totally hinging upon the fact that Moses saw something like a burning bush and was, ooh, and then he went and looked. I think it's a quick lesson to us. If you see something kind of maybe interesting, you may want to go take a look because you may not know what God is doing over there. If Moses doesn't go see, stop, stop to smell the roses and go see, he may not indeed encounter all of this. That's just the thing. Sometimes we've got to take the time to stop and look. But here's the thing. Now, I'm not a big outdoorsy person. I don't like to go fishing, all that kind of stuff. But every once in a while, I build a campfire on my nice little like, campfire stove. Right? <laughs> but here's what I know about fire. Fire, no matter what, requires fuel. Wood, charcoal, cardboard, paper, whatever. You need to give it fuel for the fire to keep going. Fire, as you know, is essentially things that are being burnt up or burned through. Okay? And so if you've ever built a campfire, you know that you have to keep feeding the fire or the fire is going to eventually burn out. Well, the reason why God shows up in a bush that's on fire but isn't being burnt up is to say that I, God, am the fire that does not need fuel. Why? Because I just am the fire. I am a fire that's self-sustaining. By the way, a self-sustaining fire is physically impossible in a world. It's a physics impossibility. So what God is saying is simply, I am a God who does not depend on anything. Why? Because I always just sin. If you don't think this is significant, it is. Here's why. If anyone were to ask you or me, who are you? You know how you would answer? It'd be different in form, but we would all answer at some point by telling them, hey, this is my name. I'm Pete. Oh, and by the way, I'm Korean. And my parents are so-and-so. And I live here in Houston, etc., etc. In order to explain to any single person on the planet who you are, I, you, have to name and identify all that I'm dependent on to be who I am. It's not shocking to you, I'm not Korean if my parents are not Korean, right? I don't live in the U.S. if my dad didn't decide to immigrate over to the U.S. long, long, long time ago. I am not my height if my parents don't have a certain gene pool and then God used that gene pool to give me this height, etc., etc. I don't look the way that I do unless my parents look the way that they do. All that I am and all that you are are completely dependent on other things and other people for who they are and what they are. Everyone on the planet is like this. The only one that's not? God. Why? Because he is the I am, the who I am, I always am, I ever, ever, forever, it's just I am. Now, now that you know what I am kind of means or in its significance, imagine then, 
that this I am, the one of a one kind power in the entire world, then says, more importantly, not only am I am, I am your God. And you know what it means when God says, I'm your God? It means I want to know you and I want you to know me. Look at what he says. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. That's verse 6. Then for whatever reason, in verse 15, well, we know the reason, right after God reveals his name to Moses, he switches how he wants to be called. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all the generations. This is a major change. Earlier, before Moses asked, he goes, Who are you, God? He goes, I'm God. But then right after he tells his personal name, he says, no, 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 I'm not just God. I'm Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, who has sent you. This is God revealing his personal name to tell people that I no longer want to just be called God, but I want to be called by my name. Nerdy stuff in Hebrew. The word God, if you see it in the Bible, like G-O-D, is the Hebrew word Elohim. If you see capital L-O-R-D, that is Yahweh, his divine name. And the difference is absolutely astronomical. Because the word God is like a title. It's not like a, it is a title. It's like Pastor Pete, Dr. Kim, President Biden. But the name is different. It's very personal. In life, when you meet somebody, right, who you don't know, but it's important, or maybe older, or whatever, you will always address them by their title. Mr., Mrs., Dr., General, whatever, whatever, right? My wife, she teaches sixth grade, Christina. If any one of our students ever dared call her Christina, she'd be like, oh no, child. I am never Christina to you. I'm only Mrs. Chung to you, always and forever. Don't get it twisted. Why? Because it matters. Now, imagine that you went to go meet the President of the United States. Just pick any president if you don't like President Joe Biden. I would not go up to President Biden and go, hey, by the way, Joe, nice to meet you. Have a, have a good one. Why? Because he's not Joe. He's President Biden. But let's say I work for President Biden for a while. And I see him every day and I talk to him, whatever, whatever. And the one day as I'm going to and I'm doing my job, whatever, let's say I report to him every morning. I go, President Biden, this and this. He goes, Pete, it's not President Biden. Call me Joe. Now, as awkward as that is for a Korean person, you know? You know what it means? It means that the President of the United States thinks of me or you in a certain way, thinks highly enough of you, thinks that you and he are so close that you ought to call him by his name too, because calling him by his title is no longer good enough. Students in the room, or even adults, imagine your favorite celebrity. If I met LeBron James, I'd call him Mr. LeBron James, even though he and I are the same age. I'm actually older than him. But if he's like, no, call me LeBron, I'd be like, bet. Or you know what? My idol is Michael Jordan. I'd be like, oh, Mr. Jordan, <laughs> your airness, your highness. Nah, just call me Mike. Ooh, let's go, Mike, bet. You know how this feels. And yet... God is saying, the title, God, is no longer good enough. Call me Yahweh. Because I am yours and you are mine. I want to know you and I want you to know me. I want to be known by you. Did you know the word Yahweh appears three times as many as God and, uh, as God in the Old Testament? Nerdy stuff. Yahweh appears 6,828 times, God 2,600 times, and then the short form L, 228 times. But beyond the nerdy stuff, here's what it means. The God who is literally always and forever, the one that does not have a beginning, the one that does not have an end, the one that always is, says to you, I want to know you and I want you to know me. This, by the way, is the reason why I read L-O-R-D as Yahweh, because to call him Lord is not good enough. So missions, God says, is his desire for all the world to know him well enough that they can call him Yahweh. But it gets better, and here's the third thing, and the reason why we go because of his name. 
now that God has told his people that I am Yahweh, he begins to tell them throughout the story of Exodus more and more about what his name means. And because he is the always I am God, it means that every time he attaches a characteristic to his name, I am Yahweh, who is this, then it means that characteristic goes forever and ever and ever. And so throughout the rest of the Exodus series, he begins to then tell us who he is and what his name means. Now I'm just going to read you them and go through them very quickly. You can look into them later. But as you hear, then hear the kind of God our God is. And then realize the reason why God wants us to go on mission so that the whole world may know that not only is he the I am, he is the I am who is also all these things that we're going to say. And how that will change the world in ways that you and I hopefully will desire. Exodus chapter 20, he says this, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Church, we go on missions because our God Yahweh is a God who rescues his people and delivers them from sin, suffering, slavery, and all of that. That's a big deal. Then later in chapter 20, verse 5, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations. God is a jealous God. Do you know what that means? Jealous in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is this. That means he is zealous or enthusiastic or passionate about protecting that which is precious to him. God thinks you are so precious that he's passionate, enthusiastic about protecting you from the bad things. 29, verse 36. They shall know that I am Yahweh their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Did you catch that? God wants to dwell with you, make home with you, live with you. We're, we invited the O's to come this weekend and we're hosting them. I prayed really long and hard that somebody would step up to host them in their home. And somebody did. So for the last three days, they've been at somebody's home. But do you know why that was such a big prayer of mine? Because anytime you ask anybody to visit, anytime you want to show that you love someone, it's so different. Putting them in a hotel and then inviting them to your own home is so very different, isn't it? To invite them to your home means I want to really get to know you because you're going to see me in my pajamas and with all my eye boogers and all that stuff and that's okay because I want you to know me and I want, you, I want to know you. God says I want to dwell with you. 33.19 After Moses asked God, show me your glory, God responds like this, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you and I will be gracious to who I am gracious and compassionate to who I am compassionate. God is gracious and compassionate. The God who wants to know you and be known by you wants to save you, help you, be gracious and compassionate to all of your hurts and pains. And then 34, 6 and 7, we've got to finish. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, and yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on their grandchildren, to the third and fourth generation. This is one of people's favorite verses about the character of God, because it says so many amazing things, right? This God who is the I am, he's compassionate, amazing, gracious, amazing, slow to anger, so amazing, abounding in loving kindness and truth, amazing, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, amazing, who forgives iniquity, sin, transgressions, amazing, and yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Wait a minute. Did you catch that? Okay, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, truth, all that stuff, amazing, who forgives sin, amazing character, and yet does not leave the guilty unpunished. Did you catch how they don't work, actually? How do you forgive all sin and then still punish the guilty? If God is going to forgive my sin, then how am I not going to go punish? Because I'm guilty of the sin. How does that work? Well, if you've been with us a long time, you know exactly where this is going. This is the Bible answer to everything. It's Jesus, isn't it? But here's how. John 8, 58. Jesus is talking with a bunch of the Jews about Abraham and all this stuff. And right at the end of this, he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, oh, here we go. Before Abraham was, I am. 
Now, right after this, all the Jews there want to take stones and they want to throw it at him. Why? Because he is personally and purposely invoking the divine name of God, I am. Now, church, let me just ask you, why is Jesus there messing with all the Jews anyway, talking about Abraham? That's not a trick question. God is there, why? Because he's there, because he wants to show us that he is a God who wants to know us and is indeed loved by us and we want to know him. Didn't God come to rescue and deliver us from suffering? Doesn't Jesus come because he sees and knows and hears the suffering of his people and wants to do something about that? Doesn't Jesus come because he wants to abide in us and him and uh, and us and him make home in us? Does God not come to be gracious and compassionate to us, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness? But mostly, doesn't God come to forgive sin and therefore leave no guilty unpunished? And how does God do that? By taking all of our guilt and our punishment upon Him. Church, we go on missions because of His name. Why? Because the only name that stands and says, I will take all the guilt and punishment of the entire world so that we do not have to is indeed Jesus and Jesus alone. We go on missions, church, because we need the world to know, to shout with everything we have in our lungs, that this is our God who sees them, who hears them, who knows their suffering. That this is a God who is for them, who wants to rescue them, who wants to be with them. That this is a God who wants to know them and wants to be known by them. The one who is jealous for them to protect them because they're supremely precious to Him. The one that loves them like no other church. That's why we go, because He was sent to us first, isn't it? Do you know what Jesus' name means? We'll finish here. Sorry I went long today. Jesus' name is the word Yeshua. Do you know what Yeshua means? Yahweh saves. The I am Yahweh who saves. And the way that we know he saves is he's the one who dies for us, is with us, and therefore we are with him forever. Church, let me just put it this way. I don't know how God is calling you. I don't know how you respond to Peter and Jenny and all these missionaries that come. But maybe what you need to do is to go see him and meet with him and pray and ask him what he might be doing in your life. And let me just tell you, if he calls you, which he will because you're a Christian, then you must go. And may you go because he is with you. So would you go see this great I am? Would you then know him and therefore be known by him and therefore be called? And in your calling, then go. So church, As a saved people, would you then be the sent people to go tell the world who